vermouth. What is it? How do you drink it? How do you keep it? If you're a pub or a bar, how do you flip it well make money from it? Now, before you turn off because you're thinking, I don't like vermouth, stop. Let me open your eyes a little bit to this. Bottles like this right here and a few others on my back bar are the precise reason why I wanted to sort of quit the rum journey and kind of open myself up to other spirits because I've fallen in love with this category and up until about eight weeks ago, it wasn't really even on my radar. Now let me dive into the backstory here. This will probably ring true for a lot of you and for a hell of a lot of you watching this, you might not even be familiar with what vermouth is. So most people's backstory, unless you're in proper high-end cocktail bars in London in hotel bars, your perception of vermouth, even if you know it is that, is going to be martini. And I'll guarantee you, a lot of people don't actually realise that martini is a vermouth. They just think martini is martini. They don't really appreciate of what the actual category of drink is. Now, cards on the table here. Martini is precisely the reason why I never really paid much attention to the vermouth category as a whole up until now. There is another part to that story as well. I'm not a huge wine drinker. I'm not a big fan of wine. But the funny thing to that is that I love brandy. Absolutely adore brandy. And if you're thinking, if you don't know the differences, if you don't know, hang on, what's going on here? Why brandy? What wine? It's a, brandy is, a, is like a, is a distilled wine. Brandy comes from grapes, you know. So the sort of hypocritical bit of me, I love brandy, but I'm not a huge wine drinker. Now, if your only experience of vermouth is Martini or Shinzano, or maybe even supermarket-owned brands in the UK, I'd urge you to carry on watching because my eyes have been opened. I can't, I've always known what vermouth was, but as I say, I've just avoided it because my impressions of vermouth is I don't like martini. So where has this all come from? Why am I suddenly liking vermouth now? You know, what, what, why? Why am I featuring it on, on this channel? This is not a pay promotion in the slightest. I just, I, as I said, I've recently fell in love with this. Now, there has been, this all started probably about a year ago when I was uh, out for a night down in London at one of the rum bars, Black Parrot. Just before I came in there, there was um, uh, one of the reps from Sacred, which is a distillery here in the UK. They make gin and stuff, but they also make their own vermouths. And if you've watched a couple of videos here where I've called for vermouth, the Sacred Extra Dry is actually what I've had behind the bar for a while. I've run out of that now. Thank God I have, because I've, I've upgraded. I've gone even better. But the whole point to that story is that because I think Sacred had actually four vermouths. And up until that point, I'd never really tasted different vermouths other than Martini. I've had Lillet, for example. Um, but again, it's only been purely for cocktails. So I haven't really drunk it. So that tasting that night opened my eyes and I was just like, wow, this actually tastes incredible. Now roll forward six, eight, ten months, I still hadn't really paid it much attention because I was in a rum journey. The only, you know, the only reasons I would need vermouth is really the Manhattan, maybe the odd rum Negroni. I don't really need vermouth. So you can't, I've just kind of ignored it. And then about, I'm going to say about six weeks ago, I got invited to a cocky um, tasting. Now cocky again is an Italian sort of vermouth and the brand, they've got various different ones. And I was on that and I tried them and I was like, actually, wow, do you know what? This is very, very different to Martini. And that kind of opened my eyes a little bit. And then I wasn't stalking, I wasn't going around, but just randomly, very, very randomly, these guys cropped up in my radar. This is Vault. And if you look at this, they're actually based 10 minutes down the road from me. And it is absolutely phenomenal liquid. So a couple of weeks after I found them, uh, I went, I kind of messaged him on Instagram. I was just like, hey, I'm, I'm in Saffron Walden all the time. Uh, can I come around and see you? They're actually part in a, a restaurant called Chater's. There's a, like, a little distillery, a little vermouth vault at the back of Chater's restaurant. And I walked in there, met Danny and Matt, 
and absolutely fell in love with what they're doing. We've actually got two more things up there. We've got vodka and a gin, which I'll talk about another time. We've got a, a bitter, a Campari alternative, which I'll talk about another time. Today, I'm just purely concentrating on vermouth. So look, we're probably like three, four, five minutes into this video now, and I still haven't really described what it is. You're thinking martini. Well, what the hell is martini? Where does it come from? We've established wine, but you know, what is fortified wine? What does that all mean? How is it different to, you know, wine? How is it different to brandy? So if you're a vermouth connoisseur, if you're a vermouth, vermouth expert, close your ears now because I'm going to really, really dumb this down. I kind of have a broad understanding of what it is to kind of educate. I'm not an expert by any stretch of the imagination. So this is my dumbed down explanation of what vermouth is. And to start this story, I want to focus on gin because most people comprehend what gin is. So if you can get your head around this, gin is basically neutral grain spirit. And to be even more, you know, dumb that right down, think vodka. You know, it's we call it NGS, neutral grain spirit, typically a higher ABV. So like 90% ABV, 96% ABV. And you would take that, NGS is essentially vodka. You would take that and you would infuse distilled juniper and various other botanicals into that neutral grain spirit slash vodka and you get and you distill it and then you get your gin. Now at bare bare basic level, think of this, instead of your neutral grain spirit, think of this as wine. So Pinot Grigio, Chardonnay, you know, think of this as wine. So instead of neutral grain spirit, you've got wine and then you infuse that wine with different herbs and spices, not juniper, but different herbs and spices into that wine. So once you've kind of got that infused, macerated, whatever word you want, you've got this wine that's been flavored, aromatized with all these different flavors. And then to fortify it, you're then adding a higher ABV alcohol, sometimes NGS, sometimes vodka, sometimes Brandy. Now, look, I'm going to get a bit technical here for a second because actually, in the grand scheme of things, it's a lot easier to extract flavor from herb spices and fruits and that. It's a lot easier to extract flavor from a high ABV alcohol. So, actually, what a lot of vermouth brands do is they infuse their botanicals, not juniper, but they infuse their other botanicals into an NGS, a neutral grain spirit of like 95, 96. They infuse that and then add wine to that because as I say it will be easier to extract the flavor in a higher ABV. Higher ABV spirits extract flavor quicker and easier than low ABV. Now if you start to grasp and understand that you can then start to appreciate how different how vermouths can be different and it's so wrong to tarnish the whole vermouth category with that I don't like martini. It's completely and utterly wrong. In, in You know, to relate this, it's like saying, I don't like wine because I don't like Chardonnay. In fact, I know a lot of people that don't like Chardonnay, but absolutely love Sauvignon Blanc or Pinot Grigio. You know, and when it comes to red, I know a lot of people that don't like Shiraz, but love Merlot. So to bracket the whole vermouth category together and think I don't like martini, so therefore I don't like vermouth, is absolutely wrong. And even I've been guilty of that for a bulk of my career. So to point out the three big massive variables when it comes to making vermouth. Obviously, your base wine makes a huge, huge difference. A Chardonnay is going to taste very different to a Sauvignon Blanc, which is going to taste very different to a Pinot Grigio, which is going to taste very different to a Chenin Blanc, which is going to taste very different to a Sauvignon Blanc. You know, so you've got all that. The wine makes a huge, huge difference. Then obviously the botanicals used make a huge, huge difference. Think gin. You know, you take your base gin and there are so many. I mean, when gin was in its boom, there were, I think it, I think it was roughly 6,000 different gins available in the UK. Each and every one of those had different uh, botanical DNA. So think vermouth, you know, again, 
is going to be very different botanicals. What Martini might use as their botanicals, they don't, they'll use like flavor compounds, but what Bata what Bacardi, um, Bacardi, what Martini might use, what Lillet might use, what Dolin might use, will be very, very different to what Volt are using, to what Lestau are using in Spain. And then just touching on Lestau, which has featured on this channel because Lestau has been the one I do actually really like, instead of wine at the base, because Lestau is from Spain, it's sherry at the base of Lestau. They are sherry vermouths instead of wine vermouths. So as again, we go back to the wine and that makes a huge, huge difference. And then the third massive and obvious variable is actually what the higher ABV alcohol you're cutting this back with. Because if you're cutting a vermouth back with vodka, which is neutral in spirit, neutral grain spirit, that again is going to taste very, very different to a vermouth that's cut back with brandy, which is grape at the base of it. So hopefully now you begin to appreciate the breadth of vermouth, of what each and every brand has to offer, how they're different, and how just like even trying two is not really going to do you any justice at all. Now, to put this into some sort of perspective, throughout my career, I've always had the opinion that I don't really like Italian vermouths. I've preferred a few French vermouths and a few uh, Spanish vermouths. vermouths. And that, I've always attributed that to the base wines. I'm not a huge Italian wine fan, apart from uh, a red. There's one red that I really, really like from Italy. But I probably prefer French wine, definitely brandy, and Spanish wine, sherry, brandy. Okay, so in my head, I've always preferred France and uh, French and Spanish vermouths over Italian vermouths. But Italy probably, you know, are the market leaders when it comes to making vermouths. So hopefully that dumbed down, and I'm sorry for all the experienced vermouth experts out there. Hopefully that dumbed down explanation kind of resonates a little bit and you kind of understand it more. But if you have got any questions, put them in the comments below and hopefully we'll have some vermouth experts crop up that can actually go into depth and answer those questions for you. Uh, so if you've got any questions, whack them in the comments and we'll try and get them answered. So we've hopefully covered what vermouth is, but then the next big question, and this is like an old wives tale, it is actually true. And how do you keep it? How do you store it? Now, you have to appreciate this is still low ABV. These are, I think they're all 16.6 .6 across the board. I don't definitely two of them are. I think they're all 16.6. .6. Um, but they are obviously a lower ABV than what spirits are, gin, wine, vodka, rum. Now, people thought it was an old wives' tale, and it sort of rings true with some vermouths, and it doesn't with other vermouths. For example, so the wives' tale is it needs to be treated as wine, it needs to be kept in the, the fridge, basically. And if you go even better, if you've got those uh, vacuum, what they call vacuum vans or vin de verre or whatever it's called, where you can suck the air out of it and keep it like that. If you could go one better and do that, your vermouth is going to last a lot longer. Now, because this is wine, this will eventually, like a normal bottle of wine, would turn to vinegar, turn, you know, start to maybe sort of ferment and kind of explode a little bit. I've had bottles of Lillet in here that have kind of exploded after six months or so because they haven't been kept in the fridge. So the ideal thing is to keep these in the fridge. That will keep it in as close to tip top condition as you could possibly get. As I say, alcohol preserves things. The higher the ABV, the longer stuff is going to last. When it's a lower ABV, you haven't really got that kind of length of time to kind of keep stuff. Now, the contradiction to that is I had bottles of martini on my back bars for years and years. And if you go to most pubs and bars, I guarantee the bottle of martini on the back of the bar will have been open at least six months, if not a year longer, because it's really not a huge deal. I don't know the ins and outs of certain brands, but I do know certain brands do use antioxidants quite a lot. The same it goes into bottles of wine. So the chances are they are going to be fine on your back bar. They're designed to go on your back bar and not be kept in the fridge. But if you go down the route of decent vermouth, then yes, 100% you need to keep it in the fridge. So let's get on to how you drink vermouth. And this is why I'm getting all excited and my eyes have been opened because if you're a bartender, traditionally, you would know of Manhattan's, Negroni's, Martini's. They are the three big reasons you'll have a vermouth on your back bar. But actually, it offers so much more than that. As you'll have seen here, I've just been drinking that neat. That is the meadow, the white vermouth that Volt do. And that is 
absolutely gorgeous and the caveat these have been in the fridge so it's ice cold anyway but that is gorgeous to drink neat now another fact for you when i first started working behind a bar the day after my 18th birthday the two very first drinks i ever served was shinzano bianco and lemonade shinzano is another brand of vermouth it's the competitor to martini so martini bianco basically but shinzano bianco and lemonade they were the first two drinks i ever served working behind a bar so for old school vermouth and lemonade is pretty much you know the long mixed drink however there's a new kid in town and this is where my heart has gone i'm gonna put this out there i'm not a tonic fan at all i gin and tonic you know it just doesn't do it for me it's not that i hate tonic i just don't really get on with it I'm revising that statement because actually vermouth and tonic, which is exactly what this is. This is the dry vermouth, the coastal. Oh dear God, this is absolutely delightful. And there's such a good thing with this as well because it actually fits into the no and low category of drinks. This is really low ABV. Give you a rough ballpark because this is 16.6% ABV and you sort of dilute it down with 150 ml of tonic water. This comes out at 4% ABV. That drink is just 4% ABV. Now, if you cut that back to say 30 ml of vermouth, with the same with 150 mil that now brings that ABV down to just under three. It's about 2.8% ABV, which makes it a lot less boozy than a gin and tonic, a lot less boozy than a glass of wine. And for my money, so much more delicious than either of those. I would love, I could have that over lunch every single day of the week. It is fantastic. Now let's just go on to a couple of things here. If you look in these bottles and think, oh, he's got through all that quite a bit. Um, it's a little deal I've got with the Vault guys. Um, we've I've I've got bottles, but the cool thing that Vault have cottoned onto, yes, they do refill. So you get you could buy a bottle of the um, the vermouth, and we'll go into the other things as well, the gin, the vodka, the bitter. But you could buy bottles of vermouth, and because of that shelf life, because you need to keep it in the fridge, if you go through a lot of it, you can actually get refills in cans. They do can seven hundred fifty mil cans as well to fill these bottles. But the really, really cool thing, which will be perfect for me so I can do videos in a casual drink, is they do 200 mil refills. So what I've got so far to start my... I don't even know whether the right way around. But what I've got to start myself off, I've had two cans of these. So 400 mil. So, of course, just because they're just down the road, I can just nip in and get another 200 mil and I'm set for another couple of weeks of videos without it ever going off. Or without you know without it sort of spoiling or anything is just the perfect kind of a business concept if you like now of course while this is a vermouth video in general there's a couple of more bits i'm going to give you i'm going to kind of obviously tell you what these are be rude not to tell you kind of the dna of what these three vermouths are but i'm actually going to give you some other serving suggestions in a second as well but very quickly let's just dive into these now i'm not going to remember what these are so i've got to refer to my notes of what they've uh, what the guys have given me here so we'll start off with this one. This is should be the coastal, which is the dry, yeah, the dry vermouth. So think your equivalent to martini extra dry, but even 10 times better isn't doing this any justice. 50 times, 50 times better, excuse me, tonic burps. So the DNA of that coastal, we've got an infusion of several botanicals, including oyster shell, olive leaf, and a mouthy lemon. That infusion is then blended with the base wine, which is English Bacchus wine. So you've got those botanicals that have gone into an, a, a blend of English Bacchus wine that has already been uh, blended with other um, but other botanicals. So effectively, this is what I was referring to earlier. To get my head around this, I'm pretty sure this is how it's made. They take that oyster shell, olive leaf and Amalfi lemons, probably infuse that with the neutral grain. So they've got all that flavor and then they infuse that into the English Bacchus wine that has then been sort of macerating with other botanicals in it. So the kind of, it works like that if you kind of understand my meaning. Now for a dry vermouth, you are talking tonic. It is a great, great drink. I'm going to be, as I say, a couple of other variances here, but you're obviously talking your um, martinis as well, your dry martinis. It's going to be cracking for that. But don't think you can't drink it neat because you flip it can. It is gorgeous neat, especially if it's kept in the fridge. Now we'll move on to the vermouth in the middle, which is the meadow. 
in a white vermouth. And again, I'm really sorry, Vault guys, but to dumb this right down, I think Martini Bianco, I think Shinzano equivalent, but 50 times better. This would be your aperitif. If I'm being brutally honest, yes, you can drink this with tonic and it's flipping delicious with tonic, but I really do prefer the dry with tonic. That's just me. For me, I kind of like the different flavoured sodas that are coming out in a second with this, but that, the dry with tonic, is absolutely phenomenal. So this and uh, the meadow, what I've done with this is kind of bracket is a herbaceous floral white vermouth. And the botanicals that have been infused to start off with is lemon, verbena, licorice root, and meadow hay with various other botanicals. That's then infu infused into English Bacchus wine that's been infused with fresh forest herbs and flowers, including thyme, meadow sweet, and dandelion. Now, obviously, the difference between the two, the dry is obviously dry, so unsweetened, whereas the uh, meadow, I keep calling that coastal for some reason, but the meadow, this sort of in between one, the meadow is actually sweetened up very slightly with honey. And then we go on to the red vermouth, which a lot of people refer to as sweet vermouth, but sweet vermouths aren't really that sweet. They're just a little bit sweet and then dry vermouth. But it's just this thing, we see red and we think it, we call it sweet vermouth. Your red bartenders are gonna know this, your Manhattans, your Negronis, those sort of cocktails, that's why you'd have a red vermouth behind your bar. They go hand in hand with those style of cocktails. But this does work really well, neat again, especially straight out the fridge. It works exceptionally well with tonic. It works exceptionally well with different flavored sodas as well. Not sweet sodas. I don't mean Fanta or lemonade or, or Sprite or anything like that. I'm talking proper flavored stripped back soda waters. Now to quote the vault guys, this a vibrant, bittersweet red vermouth, red vermouth with infusing of botanicals, including rhubarb roots, orange, and wormwood. So again, you've got that base infusion, say probably with um, neutral grain spirit, although one of the, if not two of these, are infused with brandy. I don't know which ones, I'll be brutally honest. But just say those, those botanicals are infused with a higher ABV alcohol, and that is kind of blended together with English Bacchus wine again, which has then been uh, infused with nettle, pine, rosemary, and various other botanicals. And that vermouth has been gently sweetened with a bit of demerara sugar. Now, how do you drink it? If you're a pub or in a bar, how do you capitalize on this? How do you make more money? Does vermouth and tonic kind of register with your customers? It may be a little bit of hard work to convert them, but actually moving on to something like this would be a little bit easier. You know, I, I the, if you word it properly on a menu, I don't think you'd have any issues converting people over to this from a gin and tonic, say, you know, say lower ABV means they might have a couple of extra drinks. It means they might even have a drink in, uh, like this instead of like a glass of water with lunch if they're driving, you know, 3% ABV, 2.8% ABV at 30 mil. You can't go wrong with this sort of stuff. The long-term viewers will know that I am firmly team Franklin's and Sons over team Fever Tree. I really, in the grand scheme of things, yes, Fever Tree do a couple of lines that I kind of do like, but in the grand scheme of things, you know, product for product, pound for pound, you know, Franklin's and Sons for me just smash it over Fever Tree. And I know that through various blind tastings as well. People have their being this being their bonnet about Fever Tree being the best until they taste it blind against other tonic waters, against other things. They're like, okay, yeah, I kind of understand. You know, going back to pre-COVID when I used to do, uh, you know, gin nights, gin tasting nights, Fever Tree would never win. Fever Tree would more often than not come either bottom or second from bottom out of six different tonic waters. Franklin's and Sons would be one of those up there with Schweppes that would either come first or second. Now we've kind of got sort of two groups, two categories of drinks here. We've got sodas and then we've got tonic waters. Now, if you know Franklin's and Sons, you'll know that in that range of flavored tonic waters, they've actually got four. Um, there's the pink grapefruit in bergamot, there's the black olive and rosemary. I'm kind of forgetting the other one, if I'm being really, really honest. I honestly, I really only focus on the rhubarb and hibiscus. That for me is absolutely delightful. And then you've got this Sicilian lemon tonic, think Schweppes bitter lemon, you know, virtually, you know, for me, this tastes better than Schweppes better, better lemon, but pound for pound, I virtually similar things, okay? If you're a bar that serves Schweppes, you know, bitter lemon, that's where we're going for now. And then we've got their tonic water there. Now, for me, 
These work across category. We had a little play here the other day and I really, really like these. Some of my favourites to pick out was that forest, the red vermouth with the bitter lemon and the rhubarb and hibiscus. Those two together, the rhubarb and hibiscus was that, was just absolutely insane. So, so good. The uh, the whites, the meadow vermouth. The meadow vermouth, I really, really loved with the guava and lime soda. I just thought that was absolutely fantastic, those combinations. And you haven't got the quinine in the sodas, so you haven't got that little bit of bitterness in there. But delicious. And then coming back to that, you know, the uh, the dry, I really do. I, I love it with plain tonic water, I do. But then all of it works. You know, the... the um, uh, the bitter lemon worked, the rhubarb and hibiscus worked, those soda waters worked. For me, the pineapple and almond was probably the better of the three with that. I think the dryness of that really complemented that. But just so easy. You don't need to get technical. You don't need to go crazy. You don't need to go com like creating other cocktails. A simple vermouth and mixer menu, I guarantee it, for the price they are, I guarantee it will put loads of cash in your tills and that's yes i'm big in vault up because they are local they are literally down the road to me but if you are out there looking you can't have got access to vault or you think they're a little bit expensive i would urge you to look beyond martini you know martini is just a catch-all i've got i don't know where they are now i've got bottles of dolin here so, oh they're here right in front of me i've got bottles of dolin which is a decent red vermouth i've got uh, which is a bit slightly different i've got luxardo bitter bianco there um but you know, I've, I've had that um, uh, sacred dry vermouth and it's so much better than martini. I, ex I urge you, this is the category for pubs and bars you really do need to explore. And even if you're at home and you want like something different, I, I think this is a belting way to go. I really do. Have a look at different vermouths out there. Try some because just because you don't like one, it's like wine. You might not like a Pinot Grigio, you might love a Chardonnay. You might love one brand of vermouth. You might hate another brand. You know, but get into vermouth and tonic. Absolutely delicious.